before the Sunday message today, we shall have a brief period of scripture reading. The Gospel according to St. John. The Gospel according to St. John. John 11. John 11. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way, and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come, and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly, and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it 
that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees, and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we, for this man doeth many miracles? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it, that they might take him. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody has said, Praise the Lord. The Lord be with us. And make all of us faithful in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your covenant. Thank you for your promises. And thank you for the goodness that you have manifested in every life. And we thank you for the challenge you are giving us. That as you are faithful in blessing us, we too will be faithful in responding to you all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the grace and the power and the strength and the courage to be faithful every time in everything, great or small, big or little, that grace to be faithful you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Be with us at the study tonight. Give us the spirit of understanding that we would understand what was said to us and we will have the obedient spirit to respond to your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Today we're studying from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, all through to verse 5. Please open your Bible. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Reading from verse 1, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And then in verse 2 it says, moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Verse 3, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment yea I judge not my own self for I know nothing by myself yet am I not hereby justified but he that judgeth me is the Lord now in verse 5 therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. 
And then shall every man have praise of God. Those are the verses we're looking at today. And you'll see that the verses talk about the stewards of the mysteries of God. It talks about the ministers of Christ. And it talks about the faithfulness that is required of everyone. Tonight, the topic is the stewards of the mysteries of Christ. The stewards of the mysteries of Christ. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the transparent faithfulness of trustworthy ministers of Christ. The ministers of Christ are expected that you'll be faithful, we'll be faithful, and will be trustworthy. And he wants that faithfulness to be transparent, and he wants everyone in everything we do to be trustworthy in the sight of God, in the sight of man, in the church, and outside the church. The transparent faithfulness of trustworthy ministers of Christ. Number two, the triumphant faultlessness of the timeless mysteries of Christ. The mysteries are coming from heaven. They were hidden in the past. Now they're revealed unto us. And what was hidden before is now explained, is now totally made visible, revealed to every one of us in the scriptures. And this truth of God, mysteries of God, is timeless. And it is faultless, it's infallible, and it triumphs in every life and in every situation. Point number three, the trivial forwardness among talkative members at Corinth. The members of the church at Corinth were not looking at the mysteries of Christ. They were not looking at the faultlessness, and they were not looking at the infallibility of the word of God. They were busy picking false, and they were busy saying that they were Paul, some of them of Apollos, and some of them of Sivas. They were talkatives. They spoke too much of things they didn't know, of things they didn't understand. They judged of things that they shouldn't have judged. They should just have had the word of God. No, it's infallible, and no, it will prepare them for heaven and prepare them for glory. They were trivial and they were frivolous in their comments of the word of God. They were forward and they were forward. The trivial forwardness among talkative members at Corinth. We're looking at point number one now. In point number one, that's where we have the transparent faithfulness of trustworthy ministers of Christ. We're looking at chapter four of uh, First Corinthians, and we're reading from verses one and two. It says, "Let a man to account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God." Then in verse two, it says, "Moreover, it is required." that in stewards that a man be found faithful. The transparent faithfulness of trustworthy ministers of Christ. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the required faithfulness of true ministers of Christ. It's required by God. It's required by Christ. It's required by the people we're ministering to is required from the past to the present to the future until we see the Lord face to face required faithfulness number two is the revealed fullness of the total mysteries of God the the revealed fullness the mysteries of God the unsearchable riches of the kingdom Everything the Lord has revealed, the fullness of the gospel, the whole counsel of God is so full and we need to be faithful to the revealed fullness of the total mysteries of God. 
Point number three there will be the reassuring fulfillment in the trustworthy man of God. Let's come to number one there. Number one there is the required faithfulness of true ministers of Christ. Let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And then in verse 2, it tells us, moreover, it is required in stewards, it's required in servants, it's required in the ministers, it's required in the preachers, it's required in everyone that is serving the bread of life and the food from heaven, serving that to the people of God. It is required in everyone, whether small or great, whether it's an apostle or prophet or evangelist or pastor or teacher or a helper or supporter. It is required in all the stewards that a man that a worker, that a watchman, that a preacher, that a woman, that anyone that is serving the people of God be found faithful. It talks about, in verse 1, it talks about the fact that we are the stewards of the mysteries of God. You understand stewards? When you go to a restaurant and uh, you order for the food you want to eat, it's still what brings it from the people who have served and they bring the food to you on the way while bringing the food they don't adjust they don't take away they don't add to it they don't add anything or subtract anything as they have been given to come and serve you so they bring everything and the lord is saying that we're still what's like that and we have no right to add to the menu to add to the meal, to add to the bread of life, to add to the mysteries of God. We are stewards and faithfulness demands as we're given, as is revealed unto us about salvation, about holiness without which no man shall save the Lord, about the power of the Holy Ghost, about the readiness and preparedness for the coming of the Lord as it's been given to us, so we serve, and so we give, and so we preach, and so we declare the word of God, the mysteries of God. We're not to add human wisdom, we're not to add human practice, we're not to add the desires of the people, we're not to add our opinion, we're not to add any kind of result or pros and cons of any debate, as stewards were required to be faithful and serve the word of God and we serve that faithfully in little things we don't say that's a small part of the word of God or that's a difficult part of the word of God people are not going to respond to that people are not going to receive that and people are not willing to repent and people do not cherish the word of righteousness no we don't have any comment we as stewards of God will bring the mysteries of God to the people in little things, be faithful. In big things, be faithful. In Luke chapter 16, reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 16, reading from verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful too in that which is much. Actually, in our lives, some little, little things come away. And if you are not faithful in those little things, you are forming the habit of unfaithfulness. And that habit of unfaithfulness will catch up with you when higher responsibilities come, when greater things come. If you say that just a little thing, I'm going to be unfaithful. That's a small thing. I'm going to be unfaithful. Nobody is watching now. I'm going to be unfaithful. My family will not know this. I'm going to be unfaithful. The senior pastors and overseers will not know this. I'm going to be unfaithful. That develops in you a habit a habit of unfaithfulness and so when other things come later you are going to be unfaithful because of the unfaithful path that is entrenched in your heart that's why the lord himself said he that is faithful in that which is least 
is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust, unfaithful in the least, is unjust also in much. And then in verse 11, in verse 11 it says, Therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches. What's that saying? When he talks about the, on, the righteous mammon, he's talking about money. He's talking about finance. He's talking about commerce. He's talking about the marketplace. You're working as an employee somewhere. You're working in society. And those places, they deal with mammon. They deal with money. They deal with material things. If you are not faithful in the secular, you are not going to be faithful in the spiritual. That's what he's saying to you, that if you are not faithful in secular things, in material things, you are not faithful in your place of work, you are not faithful because you say this is just a place of work and this is just material. If you are not faithful in the secular, the Lord is not going to commit your hand. The spiritual, it says in verse 12, in verse 12 it says, And ever ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? If you are not faithful in what belongs to another man, that he is, uh, that other man, I'm working for him, uh, and if I do my best, he's going to succeed. I don't want him to succeed. I want him to be down. I want him to be frustrated. If you are not faithful in serving another man and making other people successful, the true riches that should belong to you, you are not going to have because you are not following the steps that leads to success eventually. And we're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 2. The people that should handle the ministry and the people that should handle the work of God, they are faithful people. It is required that men of God, women of God, ministers of God should be faithful in little things as well as in big things. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. You know what Timothy has heard? He had at the whole counsel of God. You know what you have heard? You have heard the whole counsel of God. You have heard the word of God, experiential experiences that we have in the Lord for salvation, for sanctification, for righteousness, and for following after the Lord steadfastly. All that you have heard and the things which thou hast heard among many witnesses commit that commit the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Here Paul the apostle was instructing Timothy. He said, as you are the leader over the church, you are a pastor over a number of churches in the city, a number of churches in various and various locations. You must be faithful. Everything you have heard of me, everything you have heard from the headquarters, everything you have heard from your teacher, from your leader, from your pastor, you have become a pastor now, you have become a leader now, you have become an overseer now. All that you will pass on to other people. Who are those people? Not your tribesmen, not your friends, not your family members, not people you want to bribe and stop their mouth from saying whatever they ought to say. You will pass on to faithful men and faithful women in interviewing people, in selecting people, in choosing people, in putting workers and ministers and preachers and pastors over churches. Look for those who are faithful. They are faithful to the word. They are faithful to the work. They are faithful to the Lord. They are faithful to their families. They are faithful to what they have learned. They are faithful in practicing the word of God. The same thing you commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach. And it's not enough to say I'm faithful, but you don't have the ability to teach. The skill to teach and the understanding to teach. You don't have the passion to teach. You only tell stories and you only shout. You can't do that. You must be able to teach 
apt to teach, skilled in teaching, uh, teaching other people. Let's come to second section uh, in this uh, part now. is the revealed fullness of the total mysteries of God. The revealed fullness of the total mysteries of God. In First Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verses 9 uh, and 10, it says in chapter 2 of First Corinthians, please open your Bible, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. When we get saved, we love God. And God has prepared a lot of things for us. But we don't know them. We just know we're saved. But as for sanctification, maybe we don't know. As for healing, maybe we don't know. As for deliverance, maybe we don't know. As to answers to prayer every time, maybe we don't know. As for protection and prevention of evil, maybe we don't know. But now, all those things that the Lord has prepared for them that love him from this time until we get to heaven. How do we know them? Look at verse 10. In verse 10, but God has revealed them. That's the mystery. The Lord, we didn't know them. It never entered into our ear, into our heart, until the pastors who are faithful, until the preachers who are faithful, they go to the word of God. They receive the revelation of the mysteries of God. Now it's revealed to them, unto us, by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, ye, the deep things of God. That's exactly what Paul the Apostle did. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 2. Ephesians chapter 3, we're reading now from verse 2. Paul the Apostle is talking about the mysteries of God. How he received, how he now gave that to the church. And that has come to us now because Paul the Apostle was faithful. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you what? Which is given me to you what? Understand that the mysteries of the kingdom, the mysteries of God, the deep revelations of the word of God that the preacher has, that the pastor has, is given to him to you word, that means to the church. And the preacher cannot say, I'm reading the Bible, I'm studying the word of God, a lot of the mysteries have been revealed unto me just for myself. It is revealed to the pastor, revealed to the preacher, revealed to the workman, revealed to the minister for the benefit of saints and sinners. For the benefit of those who have not known, who need to know. Then he tells us in verse 3. In verse 3 it says, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. How by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in few words. Verse 4. And then in verse 4 it says, whereby when you read whereby when you read all that has now been collected into the New Testament and it's revealed now all those mysteries it's not something we're going to dig in the forest in the bush it's not something we're going to a mountaintop somewhere and we say we're praying and we're searching for the mysteries of Christ it's now revealed and you can now read and from Genesis to Revelation, the whole Bible in our hand, the, the mysteries of God are now revealed. When ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And then in verse 5, it says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. There are things, if you only read Genesis, there are things you will not know. If you only read the Psalms, there are things you'll not know. If you only read Isaiah, there are things you'll never know. 
if you only read Hosea or Malachi, there are things you'll never know. In fact, if you only read Genesis to Malachi, only the Old Testament, there are things you'll never know of the mysteries of God because it says which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles not only one apostle peter john matthew luke all those people now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophets by the spirit in verse 6 it tells us that the gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in christ by the gospel look at number three there number three is the reassuring ful fulfillment in trustworthy men of god the reassuring fulfillment in trustworthy men of god what does that mean it means these people that received these uh, mysteries of god they were partakers of the mysteries of god they saw they heard they prayed they received they experienced and they benefited from what they were given to the people of god they spoke about repentance they repented too they spoke about righteousness they were made righteous too they spoke about salvation they were saved they spoke about redemption they were partakers of that redemption they spoke about holiness they were holy they spoke about sanctification they were sanctified they spoke about the power of the holy ghost and they received the power they spoke about answered prayer and they had answers to their prayers everything they revealed of the mysteries of the kingdom and the mysteries of christ they experienced you it was fulfilled in their lives the reassuring fulfillment in trustworthy men of god look at second timothy chapter 2 we're reading from verse 6 second timothy chapter 2 verse 6 the husband man that laboreth must be false partaker of the fruits what that means literally the farmer who is producing fruit or crops must be false partakers of what is producing and the ministers to now who are laboring who are declaring who are preaching the word of god they themselves must be partakers of the fruit if the preachers are preaching and they're ministering the word of God and they're telling people uh, to be obedient to God that obedience is reflected in their lives if the preachers are preaching uh, and they're saying that we ought to enjoy the, the benefits of the new covenant they themselves must be the people that enjoy the benefits of the new covenant in their lives their faiths are active the faith they have is productive and the faith they have shows that they themselves they have tasted of the goodness of god which they are calling other people to taste the reassuring fulfillment in the trustworthy man of god it tells us in galatians chapter 2 reading from verse 20 galatians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, Paul the Apostle, he was a partaker of the faith that he preached. The faith to get saved, he had that and the faith should be obedient to the lord he had that and the faith to remain abiding in the word of god he had that and the same thing if you are ministering today the same thing if you are preaching today you have to be a partaker of the fruit of what you're ministering do you preach sanctification are you sanctified do you preach holy ghost power 
Holy Ghost baptism? Do you have that Holy Ghost power in your life? Too? Do you preach that we ought to be ready for the coming of the Lord and that the people of God should believe that Christ is coming and that when he comes, he's coming for the faithful, he's coming for those who abide and those who endure unto the end. The same thing you ought to have in your personal life as well. You become a partaker of the blessing of God that you're introducing, that you are recommending to all the people. In Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 21, is telling us that those men of God and those people of God who preach the word of God in days gone by, they were people that benefited also from what they were preaching. Open your Bible, Second Peter, chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 21 it says for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men but it says holy men look at that holy men of god they spake as they were moved and they were carried on by the spirit of god those people they had that same experience of holiness that will make them to please the lord that will make them to depend upon the Lord and lean upon the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. The same circumcision of heart, they told the people will come to them that will come in the new covenant. Those prophets experience the same thing too and they add the power of God in their lives. What an example for you, what an example for me that as we're declaring the word of God, as we're declaring the mind of God, everything we expect that the saints of God, the members of the church, the people of God should have, we too will have that same thing. And I pray that all our leaders, all our overseers, and all our pastors and whoever we are, ministry the word of truth and the word of life to other people. I pray that we too will be partakers of everything we're offering to them in Jesus' name. Let me have your good, good amen. amen. We come to point number two now, and it is the triumphant faultlessness, faultlessness, that this word of God is faultless, and this word of God is infallible, and this is the word that the Lord himself is giving to us. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 1. It reminds us, it says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and as the stewards of the mysteries of God. Let a man account of us, account of us who are preachers, account of us who are children of God, account of us who are overseers and leaders that God himself has appointed over the work of the Lord. It says in verse 2, it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It is required in stewards that he is the people who carry the word of life, the bread of life, the water of life, and they carry the revelation that brings life, eternal life, abundant life to us. It is required that they will be faithful in in all things. Look at verse 2 there. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And so, if you want to be in the ministry, you want to abide in the ministry, and you want the privilege of serving the people of God, you understand that you ought to pray and you ought to have uh, that virtue of faithfulness and that grace of faithfulness and that life of faithfulness in every area of your life. It tells us in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 3, we're looking now at verse 3, and it tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, looking at verse 3, telling us about what we ought to be and what we ought to have, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote a four time, as I wrote a four, in few words, and then it says in verse 4, in verse 4 it tells us how 
whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. It says when you read the word, it's expecting that we read. What's the point? If revelation came from heaven, what's the point? If revelation came from the Lord unto the people who are to serve us, unto the minister, unto the apostle, unto the prophet, and then it's now reaching down and it's made available to us. And we even have the Bible and we don't read. We must read. And when we read, we must endeavor to understand. And when we understand, we must endeavor to apply. And when we apply, we must endeavor to pray and have the grace to be given to us, to be obedient to that word that we have heard. It says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The mystery, remember mystery is what was a hidden but is now revealed. Is what was unknown but now it is known. Is what people were ignorant of but now we have the knowledge of that mystery of Christ. It tells us in verse 9 of that same Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 and it says and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. When that ministry has been revealed to us and when that revelation has come to us, the revelation of how we can get connected with God, the revelation of how we can remain and abide in the grace of God, in godliness as well as in righteousness, the revelation of how we're going to remain in the Lord and serve the Lord until we see him face to face in glory, that revelation. When it comes, we're not making all men see. We don't just preach part of that revelation, a fraction of that revelation. All that revelation we now declare unto the people that we're ministering to is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God. That's the mystery. From the beginning of the world, it had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. It now says in verse 10, it tells us that even though it was hidden, it's now to the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God, the wisdom that, that planned redemption, the wisdom that planned our salvation, the wisdom that planned having the same nature as Christ had, that now he gives us that divine nature that makes us righteous, that makes us holy, that makes us go in in the direction of the will of God and serving the Lord without any reservation, that now that revelation is known unto us and we don't only hear, we don't only perceive, we possess that revelation, we experience that revelation and we live by that revelation of the manifold wisdom of God. It's wisdom in redemption. It's wisdom in our conversion. It's wisdom in our salvation. It's wisdom in our perfection. It's wisdom in our sanctification. It's wisdom in its impartation of the power and the spirit unto us. It's wisdom in everything that he has provided for us that we will experience the power of Calvary. And then he tells us in a verse, he tells us in the next verse there, in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the purpose that he had for us. And this word of God and this mystery of Christ is timeless, is truthful, is trustworthy, is faultless, is infallible, and it comes into our lives, and that is what makes us triumphant. We're looking at three things here. Number one is the unsearchable riches of the mysteries of Christ. Unsearchable. 
the right unsearchable riches of the mysteries of Christ. And then, uh, number two, there is the unchangeable revelation uh, in the message of Christ. The unsearchable revelation in the message of Christ. The revelation is so deep, is so wide, is so broad, it covers everyone and it's available for everyone uh, and it's the, and it is unsearchable, it is unchangeable, it remains ever the same. Number three is our unswerving uh, recommitment to the mandate of Christ through the mystery and then to the message, he now gives us a mandate. And we have an unwavering commitment and unswerving commitment to that message and to that mandate of the Lord. Let's look at number one, the unsearchable riches of the mysteries of Christ. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 again, and we're looking at verse 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, looking at verse 1, it says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And you all, if a man, if other, other people are to account of you as the ministers of Christ, then you should carry yourself and comport yourself as ministers of Christ. That means anywhere you are. You are conscious of the fact any time and every time you are a minister of Christ. If you are not a minister, you are a member of the body of Christ where his bones and of his flesh. And because we are members of Christ, we carry that everywhere. The consciousness is there. The perception is there, the understanding is there, and the very fact that you belong to God, that, that uh, dictates your character, your comportment, and your attitude, and everything you stand for. It says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ. Let other people who see us, other people who know us, other people who know that this one belongs to the Lord, let them see that character and that disposition and that conviction and that commitment in us every time. It tells us in um, Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 33. Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 33, it says, Oh, the death of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unsearchable are his wisdom. How unsearchable are his revelations. How unsearchable are his riches, how unsearchable are his fundamental mysteries and messages he has sent unto us and his ways are past finding out. Unsearchable, so deep, so high, so great, and the Lord has given you the privilege that you'll be partakers and you'll be people that perceive those unsearchable riches. Look at verse 34. In verse 34, it says, For who has known the might of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Verse 35, verse 35, or who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. And now he tells us in verse 36, he says, For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, of him are all things, and you are part of that all things, everything he has created, everything he has brought into the kingdom, every brother, every sister, every minister, every member of him are all things, and through him is through his provision, is through his redemption, and it is through his power, and it is through his grace that you are what you are, and it says, and to him, look at that, which means then 
you are a minister, you are to minister for him, through him, and to him. You are a member, you are to live your life for him, through him, and by him, to whom be glory forever and ever. That's your life, that's your ministry, that's your action, that's your disposition, that everything you have, everything you do, anywhere you go, how you comport yourself, how you behave yourself, that everything will be of him and through him and to him in all things at all times and then uh, there'll be glory for him uh, forever and ever i pray that your life will bring glory to god every time uh, in every place in jesus name and let's go to second section there that's the unchangeable revelation uh, in the message of christ christ has a message and that message he has given unto us. And that message is unchangeable. That message is unalterable. That message does not need anything added or anything taken away. It's unchangeable. It's unalterable. He has given it from all eternity. And it remains the same today. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ, the same. And Messiah, still the same. His message, still the same. His ministration, still the same. His meditorial work is still the same. His redemption is still the same. Everything he did, is still doing now. He saved in the past, he's still saving. He, he healed in the past, he's still healing. He delivered in the past, he's still delivering. In fact, it says that his word will not pass away. Jesus Christ, in all his revelation, Jesus Christ in his redemption, Jesus Christ in his righteousness, and Jesus Christ in his plan and program to bring the church to glory. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at the reason, the conclusion for that in verse 9. It says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines for it is a good thing uh, that the heart be established with grace and not with meat which have not profited them uh, that have been occupied thereby it says his message is the same and we need to abide and remain in that message in revelation chapter 22 reading from verse 16 revelation chapter 22 we're reading from verse 16 it says i jesus have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches not just in the church of the first century in the churches all through the ages in the churches at that time in the churches at this time in the churches until it will come again i jesus have sent my angel to testify and to declare and to proclaim unto you these things in the churches i am the root and the offspring of david and the bright and morning star it says in verse 18 in verse 18 it tells us why well, testify unto every man i testify unto every minister i testify unto every apostle i testify unto every prophet i testify unto every overseer i testify unto any minister every minister in any church and every church i testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man any minister any bishop any archbishop if any man any apostle or any overseer if any man any kind of pastor in anywhere if any man shall add unto these things to add personal opinion 
to add human wisdom and to add, I think the Bible should have stated it like this. I think it should have been like this. If any man will add his own personal, private thoughts, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And then in verse 19, it says, And if any man, bishop, or pastor, if any man, apostle or overseer, if any man in this church or any other church, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and out and from the things which are written in this book. The Lord is telling us then that his word is permanent. His word is unchangeable. His word remains as it was at that time. So it is even at this time. He wants his word to remain unchanging, unchangeable. Matthew chapter 28, I was reading from verse 18. In Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then in verse 19, he declared and he sent forth the preachers of the word, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go ye therefore not only teach your nation, not only teach your community, not only teach your locality, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20 now. He tells us in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things, teaching them to observe all all things don't claim to be wiser than Christ teaching them to observe all things don't claim to be wiser than the Almighty God teaching them all things don't claim to be wiser than the giver of the mysteries of the kingdom don't claim to be wiser than the giver of the revelation of the total the whole counsel of God teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even to the end of the world and the people of God said you know when he said teaching them all things he says that teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you continues until the end of the age until the end of the church period until the end of this dispensation that's why you cannot say well this is no more acts of the apostles and this is no more the initial and the preliminary primary beginning of the church so we can take away this and so we can add that this is modern period now it says no until the end of the age until the end of the world until the end of the this dispensation until the Lord will come again teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you I pray that the grace to do that the Lord grant you everyone in Jesus name we'll come to number three there and it is the unswerving recommitment to the mandate of Christ we've seen the mandate it says we should go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and declare the truth to everyone and it says we shouldn't take away from the truth we shouldn't add to the truth we should declare everything that the lord has given we have committed ourselves to that and we're recommitting ourselves unto that we have consecrated ourselves to that we are reconsecrating ourselves to that again to this mandate that the Lord has given to the church we are looking at Matthew chapter 24 and we are reading from verse 45 Matthew chapter 24 and we are reading from verse 45 who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler 
over his household to give them meat in due season. That's the commitment we ought to have to give them the word of life, the word of salvation, the word of his grace, and the word of his power, and the word of enduring to the end, and the faithful word, and the fruitful word, and the profitable word we give to everyone in due season. What does that mean? We give to the sinner what befits the sinner. He needs to repent. We give to the backslider what befits the backslider. He ought to be restored unto the grace of God. We give to the babes what will make them grow up and mature. We give to those who are saved the word of his holiness that he'll move forward and be sanctified. We give to those who are saved and sanctified pardoned and purified, we give them the word of his power. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We give the people who are baptized in the Holy Ghost the word of his witness. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. And we give to the people who are already walking that they will improve in their work and they'll make progress in the work they're doing for the Lord. We're given the meat that is due and for everyone in the season. Look at verse 46. In verse 46, blessed is he, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. You have been doing the work of God and you have been rightly dividing the word of truth unto the people. Blessed is the man and blessed is that woman and blessed is that minister who remains faithful unto the Lord and he keeps on doing what he ought to do in the Lord so that you will not be guilty of any man's blood. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. And we're looking at verse 26, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. We're reading from verse 26, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Paul, the apostle, considered his ministry, and he looked at all the members of the church at Ephesus, and he said, I'm clear from the blood, I'm pure from the blood, I'm free, I'm innocent from the blood of any man, because he had given the word, the warning, he had given them the totality of the word. That's what we should be able to say as a preacher of the gospel. That's what we should be able to say as someone who has been given the privilege of, go, of doing the will of God and preaching the word of God that you are free, you are pure from the blood of all men. Why did Paul the Apostle say that? How could Paul the Apostle say that? Look at verse 27. In verse 27 he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I have not neglected to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I have not been negligent. I've declared unto you all the counsel of God. I have not procrastinated. I've not said, I'll do it another time until some of them have died. I'll do it another time until some of them are backsliding. I'll do it another time until some of them are no more in the church. What I ought to do at the right time, at the appropriate time, I do it at that time. I have not shown to declare unto you, to preach unto you, to proclaim unto you all the counsel of God. And then he passes that to other preachers. He passes that to other apostles. He passes that to other leaders of other local churches. In verse 28, in verse 28, he says, Take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to, to feed the church of God, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased 
with his own blood. That's the commission we're being given. That's the mandate we're being given. And that's the commitment we ought to have. And we need to keep on recommitting ourselves and reconsecrating ourselves and refocusing on the call and the calling he has given unto us. I pray the Lord will make you, make me, make all of us faithful unto the very end in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now. In point number three, we're talking on the, the trivial forwardness of among the talkative members at Corinth. You know those Corinthian people, instead of soaking in the word of God, sinking in the word of God, receiving the word of God, and letting that word of God convict them and drive them on their knees and pray about what their part and have a transformation and have a real change in their lives and let the word do good in their lives they were busy commenting i like a paul i don't like apollos no i prefer apollos i don't like a paul i don't even like apollos or paul i prefer a peter well, what are you talking about? I don't like Paul, I don't like Peter, I don't like Apollos. All I can think about is Christ. And if Christ will come down and speak to me directly, then I will hear. Otherwise, I'm just a lone man, a man of my own mind, a man of my own idea, a man of my own opinion. They were talking and they spoke too much. Instead of concentrating on the words they were hearing, and letting the world do a transformation work in their lives and a redeeming effect in their lives. What they should have done, they didn't do. We're looking at this uh, point number three now, which is the trivial uh, forwardness and forwardness, of course, among those talkative uh, members at Corinth. We're back to First Corinthians chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 3. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you. It says with me, you Corinthians, the Lord sent me there. And the Lord said, I should not be afraid. I should stay there and declare all his word. And I've declared the word of God unto you. And the mysteries of Christ unto you. And it's a small thing for me to be judged of you, Corinthians, of any man's judgment. No matter who the man may be, yea, I judge not mine own self. What did he mean by that? He said, when I've declared the word of God. And when I've declared the mind of Christ, and when I've declared the mysteries of the kingdom, and then a riot breaks out, and the people begins to shout, he eh, must die, it's not fit to live, and they begin to throw dust and ashes upon themselves, and they say that eh, Paul, he must die for this, and then they bind him. He says, well, they're doing that. I don't even judge myself. Did I do right? Didn't I do right? Was that right I preached to them? Was that the right thing? Or should I have changed my method? He said, I judge not my own self. Whatever persecution came and whatever attacks may come and whatever stoning may take place, he said, I judge not myself. Why? Because he was confident. He declared what the Lord had given him to declare. He proclaimed what the Lord had given him to proclaim. Look at verse 4. He says in verse 4, 4, I know nothing by myself. What did I know? All I knew was the old covenant. All I knew was the animal sacrifices. All I knew was what Gamaliel told me. And those things I learned from Gamaliel, they couldn't save me. They couldn't save anybody. I didn't know anything enough. I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. He was saying, 
the Lord who had committed the gospel into his son, the Lord who had committed the mysteries of the kingdom into his son, he is the one that will judge whether he was faithful to that mystery and to that message and to that uh, stewardship that the Lord had given him. That's why he said, he that judgeth me is the Lord. Look at verse 5 here. In verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the time. Therefore judge nothing before the time. There were people that will say that Paul was suffering for what he did before he became converted. He said, you can't judge like that. All that is forgotten. All that is no more. I'm a new man in Christ. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things have passed away and he has put all his transgressions, all his iniquities, all his sins in the depths of the sea never to be remembered against him anymore. Therefore, you Corinthians, you're making a great mistake. Stop all that and therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man have praise of God. It says at that time, that's the time whether it's Paul or Peter or Savers or Apollos or Timothy or anyone, whether it's an apostle or a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, whether it's a minister, whether it's a soul winner, that's the time when every man and every woman will have praise of God. As we look at this, the trivial forwardness among talkative members at Corinth, we're looking at three things. Number one, the Corinthians' inability to judge their ministers. The Corinthians' inability. They didn't have the knowledge. They didn't have the skill. They didn't have the power. They didn't have the insight. They didn't have the revelation to judge those ministers. The Corinthians' inability to judge their ministers. Number two is the compelling instruction to judge among themselves, among the members. They should have been judging whether this character is right or that disposition is right or that behavior is right among the members, among themselves, which they were not doing. And now Christ's infallibility as judge of men and ministers. We're coming to number one, which is uh, the Corinthians' inability to judge their ministers. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading there from verse 3, it says in verse 3, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of my judgment, yea, I judge not my own self. In verse 4, it says, For I know nothing by myself. Look at that. Paul the Apostle said, By myself, without the indwelling spirit, I know nothing. By myself, without the enlightening spirit, I know nothing. By myself, without the revelatory spirit, I know nothing. And if I know nothing without the spirit, I bought you Corinthians, I bought you carnal Corinthians, I bought you fleshly Corinthians, I bought you Corinthians that are warring after the flesh. If I know nothing by myself, you know nothing you know, by yourself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, therefore judge nothing you know, before the time. Corinthians, you don't know all the details, judge nothing before the time. Corinthians, you don't know all the facts about anyone, even about yourself, judge nothing before the time. Corinthians, you know nothing about the, uh, the pre-knowledge of God, the foreknowledge of God. You know nothing about the hidden mysteries of God, therefore judge nothing before the time, you know nothing until it is revealed to you. And therefore, before it is revealed to you, judge nothing you know, until the Lord come. Until 
the Lord come. And when the Lord comes, he himself will bring to light everything that we ought to know. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The people who think they are wise and they think they are prudent and they think they know enough to judge, he said, remember God has said he will destroy the wisdom of the wise and he will bring to nothing, he will bring to zero the understanding of the prudent. That's why those Corinthians were not capable to judge, they were not able to judge their ministers and it still applies today. That's why you don't have enough knowledge you don't have enough revelation you don't know all the facts you don't know what's in the mind of people and you don't know what's the intention of people you don't know the reason why this happened and why that happened and therefore you don't have the ability to judge the ministry or the ability to judge the leaders or the ability to judge the overseer or the ability to judge the one who is placed over you let's come to point number two you now what they should have been judging is the compelling instruction to judge among the members the compelling instruction that they should judge among the members look at that same verse 5 it says therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart then shall every man have a praise of God. As you look at that, who do you think that means? Does that means mean that whatever anybody is doing, we cannot say anything? Not at all. It says you cannot judge the ministry, but you can judge the character. You can judge the behavior because already you can see from the word of God, here is the commandment, here is the character, here is the comportment required of every believer. If, and if somebody claims to be a believer and is not walking in according to the lifestyle, according to the commandment of the Lord for the believer, you can see that you can compare the word of God with the lifestyle the fellow is living and therefore you can judge look at verse uh, chapter 5 uh, verse 3 in 1st Corinthians chapter 5 verse 3 it tells us for verily as absent in body and present in spirit I've judged already look at that I have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. Look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? Somebody is by you. If he tells a lie, you know that's a lie. And if he's misbehaving, you, you know, that's not correct behavior. If he's angry, you know that that is anger. If he's fi fighting, you know, you know that's bad. If he's violent, if he's a strive, you know that is striving, you know it's not all right. If he's committing adultery or committing fornication, you can tell this is not right. If it is not working, you know, according to the truth, according to the scriptures, you can tell this is not according to the truth it says do not ye judge them that are within and then in verse 13 it says in verse 13 but them that are without God judges therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person if somebody is wicked you can tell if somebody is cruel you can tell if somebody is rebellious, you can tell. If somebody is disobedient, you can tell. If somebody is unrighteous, unholy, ungodly, you can tell. And therefore put away that ungodly, that wicked, that cruel, that dirty, that defiled person from among you. They were to judge among themselves. It tells us in chapter 6, reading from verse 4. 
in first Corinthians chapter 6 verse 4 if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church he says you have leaders who should be able to judge and you have pastors who should be able to judge and you have counselors who should be able to judge and if those pastors and counselors are not judging right why don't you set the people that are least esteemed in the church and let them judge righteously and let them judge appropriately look at verse 5 in verse 5 I speak to your shame is it so that there is not a wise man among you no not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren you know, there are people that says you know we should not judge at all therefore they can oppress another person and they can steal from another person and they can go to somebody's family and defile their daughter there and then if you say but why have you done this they'll say judge not that's the only verse they know in the bible they are backsliding and they say judge not they're cruel they say judge not and they are idolatrous they say judge not and they're misbehaving and they say judge not it says look at this it says no not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren he expects us we should be able to judge Judge. In fact, it tells us in First Corinthians uh, chapter eleven, reading from verse thirty-one. First Corinthians chapter eleven, reading from verse thirty-one, it says, "For if ye would judge, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged." Your conscience is there, and if the Bible is there, and your mind is there, when you've done something wrong, when you made a step that you shouldn't have made, when you have done something, the Spirit of God will bring conviction in your heart. Your conscience will bring conviction and say, that's not right. That's not the behavior of a real believer. That's not the character of a real believer. And if at that time you are convicted and you are dreaming on your knees and then you call upon the Lord, he will forgive you and therefore you will not have to be judged. What's that saying? It's saying self-discipline will prevent church discipline self-discipline you know what you've done is wrong and then you go to the lord in prayer you know that this is not the character this is not the behavior of a real child of god and therefore you go to the lord in prayer that self-conviction and that self-discipline will make you to avoid any other person any other leader coming to discipline you for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, it says, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. If you are a person in the church and you're untouchable, you're rebukable and nobody can correct you and if they correct you then the whole of the roof will fall down you are undoing yourself and you're digging the grave for yourself and you're paving the way of hellfire for yourself because and you know you are doing wrong you know you are backsliding and you are not recovering yourself and nobody can come to help you and if we send anybody to you and we say go correct that person say please say, pastor I don't want to burn my fingers I don't want to destroy myself because I know that person if I go to talk to him he will turn around he'll bite me he'll destroy me if you're like that you'll be condemned with the world but when we're judged and we're chastened of the Lord and we're disciplined by the people who have authority over us it is so that we will not be condemned of the world I pray the Lord himself will give every one of us understanding and will escape the coming judgment in Jesus name and the church said uh, look at John chapter 7 verse 24 in John chapter 7 
We're looking at verse 24. It says, judge not according to appearance. But it doesn't say don't judge at all, but it says judge not according to appearance. You see somebody who is timid, judge not according to appearance. You see somebody who is fearful, judge not according to appearance. You know, you see somebody after the other fellow has spoken, he doesn't know what to speak again, he'll be stammering, judge not according to appearance. They all say, calm down and let him calm down and let him tell you the real sin. Make him to be at peace and then judge righteous judgment. By the way, those are the words of Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus is saying, yes, I judge me. Among the members of the church, within the members of the church, so that as they are judged and they are told that that's not right, brother, you are wrong, sister, you are wrong, then they'll be able to make their way right as we're judging. We shouldn't judge and be on the side of the one that is vocal, on the one that is aggressive, on the one that is is a kind of boisterous on the one that's able to argue his case is able to tell a lie without you detecting it's a lie judge not according to appearance but judge righteous judgment number three here is a Christ's infallibility as judge of men and ministers Christ's infallibility Christ's faultlessness as he judges eventually, he'll judge men and he'll judge ministers. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and we're reading from verses 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 4. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. He'll judge Paul, he'll judge Peter. He'll judge Apollos, he'll judge me, he'll judge you. He that judges me is the Lord. And that's the reason why we should leave all judgments which we don't understand in the hands of the Lord. In John chapter 5 verse 22. John chapter 5 verse 22. For the Father judges no man but he has committed all judgment unto the Son. He has committed all judgment unto the Son. In John chapter 12, verse 48. John 12, reading from verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words as one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The same shall judge him in the last day. There's judgment coming. And this is the time to prepare so that we don't get to that day of judgment and that day of reckoning unprepared. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, apostles and prophets. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, ministers and members, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone, every man, every woman, every member, every worker, every sage, every sinner, every rebellious person, every difficult personality that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he has done, whether it be good or bad. In verse 11, it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Judgment day is coming, and the Lord wants us to prepare. In fact, he tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 27, 
and as it is appointed unto men wants to die but after this the judgment look at that sentence two part is appointed unto men wants to die and we know that that is true and that is faultless and that is going to be fulfilled until the time of the rapture we know that from the time of adam and eve until now that sentence had been effected and that has been performed in every life appointed unto men who wants to die the great and the lowly the high and the lowly the small and the big the little and the big the educated and the uneducated the forceful and the violent everyone it's appointed unto men wants to die the clever and the dull the men and the women the church people and those who are irreligious it's appointed unto men wants to die for you and for me and for everyone no matter how wise and no matter how anybody covers up is evil is transgression and how anybody covers up is guilt it's appointed unto men wants to die a pharaoh a nebuchadnezzar a herod anyone it's appointed unto men wants to die a jezebel and ahab a solomon a delilah anyone on earth anyone on us then and on earth at this time it is appointed unto men wants to die but after this the judgment there is judgment at the end of life judgment of everything we have done every opportunity you have lost opportunity to be saved you missed it and you you cast it off opportunity to repent opportunity to seek the face of the lord opportunity to take the word of god and apply it to your life and get on your knees and get on your face and be reconciled with god every opportunity that we have wasted it's appointed unto men who wants to die and after but after this the judgment but the people that have taken the opportunities i ought to repay how to seek the face of the lord i have to be restored unto the lord i have to be saved i have to be sanctified i need to have the grace of god in my life so i can live a life pleasing unto god when that day of reckoning shall come then i'll be free then the lord will say well done you repented well done you are righteous well done you are redeemed well done you've done the will of god on earth and you have made right everything you ought to make right the blood of jesus has washed you and cleansed you and prepared you for this glorious day well done come into the kingdom of god that will be the final reckoning and i pray on that day you will not regret on that day you will not be cast away on that day you'll appear before the lord as a saved man a saved woman a forgiving man a forgiving woman a person that looked at your personal life and you let paul peter and Silas and apollos leave them alone and you leave all the ministers and the other people judging 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 them leave them all alone and then come face to face before the lord and understand when the Lord shall come, he'll not be asking you about Paul, about Peter, about Sebas, about Apollos. He'll be asking you about yourself. Where will you stand when the Lord shall come? Are you ready to meet the Lord, your God? We can make right today whatever has gone wrong and we can seek the face of the Lord and his mercy is still available. His pardon is still available. His grace is still available. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is available for everyone. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Don't make it a habit or always rising up and then going out every time that you hear the word of God and you have no chance to take that word to the Lord and seek the face of the Lord with all seriousness, with all your mind and with all your heart. Seek the face of the Lord. Anything to be forgiven, he'll forgive anything to cleanse he'll cleanse and any reassurance to give you he'll give you reassurance you'll prepare to meet the lord your god open your mouth and pray to the lord
When you say 